Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic is Lost Giants, Mexico's Ice Age Megafauna, presented by expedition leader Melissa Silva. Thank you all so much for being here today. Over to you, Melissa. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Nick. Well, um, let there's a lot of information to cover. And uh, well, first of anything, my name is uh, Melissa Silva. I'm a marine biologist. And uh, well, currently I'm uh, leading some trips with the monarch butterflies for NatHab. And uh, well, I've been always uh, fascinated by these big animals that lived thousands of years ago. So today I want to share a little bit of what I uh, was able to read and what I know now about this. Um, so well, uh, let's start. So what do you think or what comes to your mind when we say ice age or when you think about the ice age? Um, so a lot of us think about the movies that we have seen, but well, specifically um, speaking more uh, in scientific terms, there is more than one ice age. So in the history of Earth, in the, in, in the history of our planet Earth, there have been at least five glacial periods or a major ice ages. And well, they have the different durations. We have a, a, a list here of, the, of each one of the ice ages. And a, each one of those has been divided by an interglacial a, period. Within the glacial period or within the ice age, there are also subdivisions that are called the same glacial, glacial and, and uh, interglacial um, periods. And uh, actually, uh, the very last one, the fifth uh, major ice age, is what we call the Pleistocene epoch or uh, the, the Pleistocene uh, in, in general terms. Um, that one was subdivided as the, at the same time in others. And in all of these ones, actually the evolution of man uh, happened. The genus Homo appeared and it developed until the species that is now a uh, Homo sapiens sapiens. When we think about ice age, we usually just refer to the very last period of that, the last, the last glaciation that is called the Wisconsin glaciation. And that lasted from more or less 100,000 years ago to finishing more or less 10,000 years ago. And uh, specifically when we think about the megafauna or uh, like on, on this movie that I show uh, the, the image of, uh, the mammoths or the saber-toothed cats, we think on this specific period of 20,000 years ago that it's called by scientists, last glacial maximum. So basically I will be focused on this webinar in that specific moment of the of the history of our planet in this area of Mexico. So uh, 20,000 years ago, more or less, uh, the continents were more or less on the same positions as they are now, but they were slightly different. I don't know if you can see some differences here and there. For example, Florida was a little bit chubbier. You can see here the, a little bit broader areas in the Yucatan Peninsula as well. Then we had another area here called uh, Sondaland, and then uh, uh, Australia was uh, uh, together with uh, New Guinea. So that happened because the weather was uh, much colder than it is today, and that uh, allowed some ice sheets to be formed on the specifically on the northern hemisphere. They were covering a, a, a land on this area. So the sea level was lower than it is today, uh, some 1,000, 100 meters, 400 uh, feet, more or less lower. So there were patches of land that were um, uncovered, that were outside of the water that nowadays are submerged. So in this uh, scenario is where we have uh, these big ice sheets that we call as glaciers. We uh, commonly name them uh, glaciers. Nowadays, we only have the Greenland ice sheet and some patches here and there of what used to be the Laurentid uh, ice sheet in the North America area. So you can see it was covering uh, all Canada. It was covering part of the Northeast 
uh, of the states of the United States. And just for you to have an idea of how much ice was on those areas, you can have here a comparison on the um, thickness of the ice sheets in different cities compared with the with the um, horizon uh, line of the cities. So uh, up to two miles, I think, is three thousand meters, three kilometers, two miles depth, uh, thick. In, for example, in the city of Montreal. So that <clears throat> left Mexico area, what eventually will become Mexico, free of ice, but still with some glaciers on the on the high peaks on the sierras of uh, of Mexico. As I was mentioned, we had a little bit extra land here and there, and most of the territory was covered with grassland. There were some uh, forests of uh, pines, of course. Um, I think percus that are uh, percus are it's pines, ficus, and well, junipers as well. So those are like temperate, uh, colder uh, plants adapted to, to colder conditions rather than the tropical conditions that we have nowadays. For example, in southern Mexico, what is now um, Quintana Roo State, Cancun, Tulum, that area on this on the Caribbean, Mexican Caribbean. Nowadays, we have a, a, a rainy forest, like a true jungle, in this area of Mexico. Back on the day, 20,000, 10,000 years ago, this was mostly uh, grassland or uh, shrub lands, tropical thorn scrubs that were mostly on the north. This is a forest low low um trees more like like shrubs in a denser uh, foliage uh dry grasslands we used to have uh, most of the of the central plains of mexico and the and the gulf plain uh, on the on the gulf of mexico coast were dry grasslands and uh, in central areas of mexico like mexico city area for example we had these scrub woodlands associated to uh, water bodies. Because of the glaciers of the time, we used to have a lot of streams and uh, rivers that were flooding these areas on, on the central part of Mexico. So, um, well, now we know where we are located in, in, in this um, in the story I'm telling you today in, in this uh, webinar. We are back on time, different weather, different topography even. But now, what is megafauna for you, for us? To understand, in general, it is called any animal that is heavier than 45 kilograms, so heavier than 100 pounds. So basically, humans are megafauna in general terms. If you weigh more than 45 kilograms, you are considered in a, in a very strict term or a, or a very general term. Uh, speaking of of animals in um, within the megafauna. So in this term, we can also include dinosaurs we can include some fish um uh, prehistoric like uh, from the jurassic areas or um like the ammonites from from hundreds of millions of years ago but uh just to make things more narrow and easier to understand uh currently in very specific term a uh, megafauna is referring only to mammals. And if they are herbivores, they can weigh more than one, or, or they must weigh more than one ton. And if they are carnivores, they can, they can weigh more than 100 uh, kilograms. So uh, this is the, like, like the definition of megafauna that we are using in this webinar, basically, just to make things more, um, a little bit easier. So back on those days, uh, 20,000 years ago, we had many, many uh, uh, big mammals running around uh, the area of Mexico. Uh, they, they were not exclusive to the to this country, let's say. They can be uh, distributed from South America all the way to North America, to Alaska, some of them. Uh, but basically, if they were distributed on the north part of the Americas, on, on the north part of the continent, they were restricted to Central America, to um, Canada, let's say, or to the States. And if they were more um, common to the to the South American area, they were restricted to 
only the, the southern cone to, to the Central America to the south of the continent. So um, unfortunately, most of these megafauna disappeared some 10,000 years ago. And there are uh, different hypotheses and theories on why that happened. A lot of those are pointing to the humans because um, humans appear in, in the, or they arrived to the continent more or less 12,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Uh, there are some, actually some fossil prints in white sands from white sand, New Mexico. Uh, and they were from about 20,000 years ago. So there's a lot of um, of sayings in, in these that they arrived 20,000 humans, modern humans arrived 20,000 years ago. Some others say uh, 15,000 years ago. So well, there's a, a big gap over there uh, in, in the scientific community. But um, they were pointing uh, fingers. I think you can see me now. Sorry about that. Um, there are uh, uh, pointing fingers to the human interaction with the megafauna uh, to leading the extinction of these massive animals. So in this article, for example, we can see the graphic on the right. Some of them, uh, the extinction is, is associated to the weather conditions, to climate conditions. So let's remember, we had this last glaciation up to 10,000, 12,000 years ago. And then we had a warming period. This is an interglaciation time, the one that, it, that, that we are living now. So um, of course, weather was, was getting hotter, uh, humid, a little bit more humid than it was uh, back on the day. So um, these animals like the woolly mammoth, for example, they were adapted to very cold conditions. So it was very difficult for them with this quick change of, uh, of climate to um, to adapt and to thrive. So we have the, the weather, we have the um, humans interactions. This is another uh, graphic on how many animals uh, or the percentage of, of species that uh, the number of species that were extinct in each of the uh, continents and uh, well associated to the human arrival. It seems that humans had something to do with their extinction. But then there's a, a newer from uh, last year, a newer article, two years ago, last year, that um, actually is like a, like a multifactorial uh, um, result or, or, or event, a multifactorial event. So there are like these three major uh, 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 camps, the overhunting, human overhunting, climate change, or the combination of both. But honestly, uh, what they say is that due to the period of time, due to the distance from, from that um, moment of the history to now, these days, there are a lot of other factors that can be affecting this um this 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 extinction the the late quaternary extinction so uh well that's a a little bit of the scientific um answer of why for why they they uh disappear for this megafauna so now let me show you some of the animals that we used to have that that we have registers of here in um what is now mexico the country one of those is the giant ground sloth or the Pan American gi giant um, ground sloth. And well, this was quite a massive uh, animal. You can see the, the comparative size to a human, maybe two or three humans, one on top of the other, when they were uh, standing on the, on the two and the rear legs. Um, one second, please. Okay. So, uh, when they were on their, on their two feet, they were reaching up to five meters. They were basically herbivores, weighing up to four tons. Um, they were dis distributing all around Mexico. They, there are fossils actually on, there is this very popular area in Los Angeles, La Brea Pit Tar or something like that. It's a, it's a fossil area, La Brea. And actually um, pa um, paleontologists, Call a certain time of the of the uh, last glaciation, uh, Labrian Labrian time, 
and it refers to kind of like the assemblage of the fauna that was found and the and the plants that was found in La Brea uh, pit area. So um, there were many many um, slots that were living in the in the last ice age. The largest of that was a um, megatherium and eremotherium, the species that is found in Mexico, was slightly shorter, like, like three feet or two feet shorter uh, when, when standing on the rear legs. And most of those, if not all of them, evolved in South America. And some three million years ago, uh, the, when, when North and South America joined by, the, by, by Central America, there was this exchange of, uh, I, I think it's called Eocene, Eocene biotic exchange or something like that. But uh, the thing is that some animals that evolved in North America moved to South America, uh, like the camelids, and some animals that evolved in South America moved to North America, like uh, the, the giant sloths. So, uh, with some evidence of those uh, slots in South America, despite most of them are herbivores or, or mostly herbivores during their lives, uh, they found out that they could be omnivores, but it's um, not, not carnivores per se. They were not uh, uh, hunting their prey, but if they found a, a, a dead animal or a carcass like uh, this uh, image here, they will take some of the meat uh, just to complement the, the, their diet. So that's something I didn't know and I think it's very amazing and impressive to know because you always um, think of a slot as being as a very nice uh, mammal, a very uh, nice giant. So well, not always. Uh, okay, another a very charismatic uh, animal that was found in, in Mexico at that time was the saber tooth cat. And I say charismatic because, well, it's a big cat. So a lot of people like cats. And uh, despite this is one of the most uh, mortal cats that we have uh, in, the, in the history of Earth. And this was uh, more or less the size of a of an, uh, modern lion a little bit more like a sturdy, more um, heavy, heavier uh, uh, than the modern lions. Um, so the characteristic of this uh, of this cat, of course, is the is the saber tooth like that they have. And there were a lot of questions on how they use it, and how were uh, they able to to kill the prey? They, they were these teeth were very fragile actually. So there were some hypotheses that they used those teeth like for stabbing, but um, doing some science that they did, they realized the, the teeth were very fragile for that and that uh, they were, um, they could be lost very easily. So instead of that, what they now know, let's say, is that uh, they were able to open their jaws one, more than 100 degrees, 120 degrees more or less, like this figure here on the right. And what they did is that they take the throat of the, of the um, prey and they basically just took a bite of that very fast. And with that, they damage the trachea, they damage the, the, the veins, the, the carotid, and uh, well, that was almost an instant death for the prey. So basically, that's the way they use the, 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 their teeth on the saber tooth cat. Another big cat that we used to have here in, uh, in Mexico, North America, is the American cave lion. There's a little bit of confusion. Sometimes we uh, think of a cave lion only to be in um, Eurasia area, the, like the paintings in France, in, the, in this cave that were depicting the, the uh, cave lions. But that was a different species. The, um, it was a little bit bigger than the American cave lion. And um, well, this is, of course, one of the top carnivores of the Ice Age. Um, basically, they were like 25% larger than modern lions. You can see this comparison here. And uh, 
due to the to the fossils the, the register that scientists have there's some evidence that they, they hunt in solitary or by, by pairs uh, despite being social assuming to be social due to some morphology differences between males and females but even though it is thought that they didn't have like brides like these modern lions have. So uh, there's still a lot of missing information, of course, from these two cats that we have. Uh, but well, there are new and new discoveries every, every year. So um, in North America, North America, we used to have camels. We we have this genus com, uh, called camelops that it, it englobes like the ancient llamas and ancient uh, camels from from the Americas. And this is known also as yesterday's camels. So you can Google yesterday's camel or Western camel, and you will see the the information about this group of uh, camelids. And something very very cool to note about this is that. All of the camels, like like the camels that we know now from Africa, from uh, from uh, the, um, the deserts and oh South Arabia, those areas over there, um, all of those evolved from or or were a part of a lineage that evolved in North America like 50 million years ago. So the very first camels were kind of like a sheep size, very very tiny. And from there, they 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 were uh, they had a diversification in America in the continent. Uh, they when when North and South America joined, they moved to South America, specifically the llamas and the alpacas and the guanacos. So they they developed their specific characteristics down there, and the rest um, the ones in the north moved to, uh, to to Eurasia and Africa, and then they evolved in the modern camels that we have nowadays and North America lost all of their their camels so as I've been saying like we still have a lot of questions about this we still have a, a very little is known about these animals but for example in Mexico we have 27 sites with fossils of camelids and in a, very recently like two years ago they were doing this uh, this article published uh, the, early this year and uh, they found in um, pata de vaca or, or pie de vaca uh, archaeological is the paleontological site they found some some footprints from a camelid and some fruit footprints from what they think it's an american lion so uh, what they uh, conclude from analyzing like all of the, the pattern of the footprints and some other things around the area is that these uh, camels were just like uh, either grazing or drinking some water. This was this used to be like a swamp area, and they were attacked by either one or two uh, cave lions. Uh, so the footprints on how they run in one direction and how they change directions and like all this uh, crazy uh, behavior here uh, that gave the idea to the uh, paleontologist that this was like a, a hunting scenario from the from the cave lion. So uh, we used to have here, and um, we share that with you in the States, a giant bison, the bison latifrons. latifrons. Uh, this one was a massive, it, it is thought to be, if not the biggest, the second biggest bovid in the world in the, in the world his in the earth history so the the most i mean the size was was amazing almost uh, eight eight foot eight feet high on the on the shoulder um height uh, and almost a uh, five meter uh, 15 feet long from there's now to the, the the tail to the butt um but of course the most characteristic uh, uh, thing on the on the giant bison is that uh they had this almost almost seven and a half feet long horns uh this is a comparative chart this one on here on, on first uh despite on, on first plane um 
is the modern bison. So if you have seen or, or if you've been able to see a bison close enough or just uh, on, on the TV, you can tell like the size of that comparing to, to a modern human. So now you can see the very last one is this, um, the, the bison latifrons uh, is the individual. So because of the, what, what scientists think of this because of the size of the massive size of the horns and the body, the whole of the animal is that they were not very good runners like the counterpart, the, the modern counterpart. Um, so instead of being running or, or instead of running away from predators or running away from other bison, they actually uh, just fought. Uh, they were fighting against the predators with the big uh, horns and uh, they were standing their ground. So they, they thought it's um, one of the most aggressive uh, bobbits because of those characteristics. Okay, so we have a group of uh, giant armadillos in Mexico and South America. They had not a very uh, northern distribution because of the of the weather. They were more used to a little bit not so cold weather. So they basically stayed from Mexico to Central America and South America as well. Uh, so remember, these are mammals. <laughs> so despite looking like something weird, all of these bristles that you can see on this uh, artist representation, uh, those are hairs. So they are mammals, they got pregnant, they were placentarian mammals, they were uh, nursing their their offspring and well what the glyptotherium what these giant armadillos had in common is of course this carapace or this shell we can we can name it as a shell just to be uh, more an, an easier way to call it this shell this carapace was covered with something called osteoderms those osteoderms where uh, well this this uh, measurement bar is five centimeters so each one of those osteoderms that could be hexagonal or uh, pentagonal were something like this like a big uh, like a metal size more or less and there were thousands of them covering their uh, their bodies so basically there's a video here I want to show you uh, basically what they use this uh, this shell for was to prevent the attack of other predators. Here on this representation, you can see a, an American lion, American cave lion attacking a glyptodontid. And uh, well, basically they just kind of like try to make a ball of themselves and protect the soft tissue on the neck and on the abdomen. Even though there are some uh, fossils of uh, glyptodonts that are turning uh, upside down, that they died in that position. So it is thought that some of the predators, for example, the, the cave lion or the um, giant sloths that were feeding on, on animals were turning them upside down so they were able to access the soft tissue on the belly. So we used to have horses before the uh, the Spanish conquerors and before all these uh, people from the old world brought the horses here, we used to have uh, wild horses in North America. And actually, just as the camels did, they evolved in North America as well. Uh, there are several species. Ecus mexicanus is just one of those. Ecus, uh, simi Ecus feralis, something like that, is like uh, the the um the origin species of all the domestic horses that we have nowadays and uh, all of those species some of them move to south america again some of them move to uh, eurasia and uh, uh, africa so in this uh, representation we can see how they move through the Berin Beringia area and, and Canada and uh, and the Siberia area. Uh, this bridge, land bridge, that allowed humans to come here and all, a lot of animals to go there to the old continent or, or come here as well. So basically, all of the all of the equides 
That means all of the donkeys, zebras, wild horses, domestic horses, you name it, all of those come from the same ancestor. And that ancestor evolved in North America some 50 million years ago, more or less. Okay, so the Colombian mammoth, that's uh, that's one of the most uh, studied and charismatic uh, mammals from the megafauna. And actually is the one that we have, I can say like the biggest number of fossils because of course of, this, of the size of them, uh, 13 feet to the, on height to the shoulder, uh, those, bones were very easy in general terms to see or to recover and of course they they were a little bit easier to uh, preserve and be fossilized so the tusks that is the the most characteristic uh feature on the mammoths uh, were almost as big as their whole body you can see 16 feet the body was 15 feet more or less and a uh, Something that is very cool is that the, just like humans they and modern elephants, they were either left or right tossed or handed. I don't know how we can use that, but um, they use more one of the of the tusk rather than the other. Remember, these are teeth, so they are attached to their uh, cranium, to their mouth, and they just grow out very long and curvy. So um, we have here a comparative chart. Of, of the extinct mammoths. There were several species. Uh, the, the one that I'm mentioning right now, as I, as I said, is the Columbian mammoth, Mammutus columbi. And uh, well, the, this one specifically was more or less the same size as a large male from the, from the African elephant. So just for you to have an idea. And something that uh, we, Something that we sometimes make a, a, a mix or, or make a confusion with is that the, there was only the woolly mammoth in the world during the Ice Age, but not, as I, as I mentioned before in, in the previous chart, there were several different species. And here in the Americas, the uh, woolly mammoth, that is one, this one here on the right, the Mammutus primigenius, was only found uh, on the northernmost part of the continent. So they were adapted to the coldest conditions during the ice age. That's why they had this huge uh, a, a hair covering, the fur covering all of their bodies. On the other hand, Mammutus columbi, columbi uh, they were adapted to warmer conditions or to temperate conditions. And uh, in that case, they didn't have this long hair covering their bodies. So basically they look very similar to uh, what they have noticed the shape of the of the head and the shape of the face was very similar to the Indian elephant. So if, if you remember, the Indian elephant has like a narrower face, more like slender, and the um, African elephant has like a rounder, bigger uh, face. So this one looked more like a like an Indian elephant with a little bit more hair, longer hairs. Okay, so. That those are the, the species I wanted to go in a, a, little, a little bit deeper description. But let me tell you that back, um, if, if we move forward in time, not 10,000 10, years ago from, uh, uh, let's move back um, forward to 1,000, uh, 1, no, 5,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago when we started on the, on the present era. Um, the cultures that develop here in Mexico, let's say Olmecs, let's say Toltecs, the uh, Mexicas or Aztecs, the Mayans, all of those, of course, they were uh, connected with nature. So they found these, these uh, fossils. They, they found the bones of this uh, Pleistocene megafauna. So in order to give an explanation to, to those findings and uh, mixing that with the cosmology or with, with the vision of, of the world, uh, they they had this um, legend that is nowadays a legend of the kinametsin. The kinametsin were giants. It means a, a giant monster, actually, kinametsin. 
And these were giants that lived during the, the previous sun age, the previous two, two hours now. So for the Aztecs, this is an Aztec uh, uh, belief, there were like five sons or five ages before the one that we are, this is the fifth, there were four before the one we are currently living. And uh, the previous sun age was the Atona two age, is the water sun. And it's called the water sun because the world was destroyed by water, kind of like on the universal flooding, something like the biblical um, uh, history, story. And um, the Kinametsin were killed by this flooding by the Boyargot uh, Tlaloc. So they had like this um, tale or, or belief to, in order to uh, uh, explain the finding of these huge bones that resemble legs, that resemble arms. Uh, so well, that's basically how uh, ancient Mexicans uh, believe on the on the fossils. So well, if we move forward fast to the present in the late 70s, uh, there were still discoveries in in Mexico while they were building one of the one of one of the subway station stations. They found uh, actually one line in in one line uh, they found in three different stations um, mammoth fossils and one of the stations talisman is um, the symbol is a mammoth because it's the one that is actually in display on the area of of the of the subway station nowadays this is still uh, there are some findings uh, we have now I don't know I'm pretty sure you have heard of that the new airport in the north part uh, of outside of Mexico City on the north parts of it. Uh, we have a new airport, the Santa Lucia, Felipe Angeles Airport. And they discover something like 80, 70 to 80 uh, mammoth fossils, only mammoths, plus some uh, lions, camels, horses, humans. So on those discoveries, well, they realized and, and they were able to have more information on how the Pleistocene area in Mexico, in central Mexico was. So because of that, they decided to uh, put that in this new museum of uh, the, the focus only on the paleontological registers of the central area of the Santa Lucia area. And uh, well, if you any, uh, ever have the chance to, to come and take a look on that, it's beautiful. It's, the exhibitions are just the top quality uh, on the museums here in Mexico. And other areas, if you are traveling around Mexico, other areas that you can find uh, this, this kind of exhibitions, this kind of findings, is in um, different paleontological and natural history museums. This one here, uh, top left, is in Mexico City. Um, this one here, Top right is in Chihuahua, uh, the Museo del Desierto. Uh, in Puebla City, uh, we have also the Regional Museo Regional de Puebla, Regional Museum of Puebla. And then the Regional Museum of Guadalajara City. Uh, there are some others that I will stay here forever mentioning, but basically on every big city uh, in each state in Mexico, we have one museum, uh, dedicated or with part of an exhibition of this um, Pleistocene megafauna. So that would be it. Thank you, Melissa. That was great. Before we start the q and I'd like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the questions field in your GoToWebinar control panel. All right, so we'll dive right in here. So the first question is, there are a few questions about this. Why were so many Ice Age mammals so much larger than our current modern day mammals? Okay, so what it's, um, it's basically a hypothesis, so it's not proved yet. Remember, um, in science, we use hypotheses for the things that have not been proved. And the theory is something that it's that, that you have the, the the scientific proofs of that day that you can test that or or 
make a confirmation. So the hypothesis that we have here, well, the scientists, um, is that there were more resources uh, in terms of food. Let's start, remember the, the food pyramid starts always with the producers, with the plants, and then we have the first consumer, the herbivores, and then the others, and carnivores and the others. So uh, there were a lot of, of plants. We, we were, um, if you remember the, the graphic of the ice age, one second, please. Um, we were, we had like all of these uh, a, a glacial, interglacial, glacial, inter so the the living species were coming from this interglacial um, period. So there were a lot of resources. There were um, we had the loss of big predators that were the dinosaurs in 50, like 60 million, 50 million years ago, and in that time, basically there were no predators for the herbivores. Eventually, of course, we had the development of uh, the, the saber-toothed cat and the others. So herbivores were able to grow very much in order, of course, to eat more, to take advantage more. Let's think on the gorillas, for example, that they are herbivores. So they, they grow massive, but they take advantage of the food. All of the nutrients, they can take it almost 100% of them. So it's the same case with the mammoth, with the giant slot. So they were adapted to those conditions and eventually they were into the, the glacial epoch in the Wisconsin glaciation and uh, they moved to the central part of the, of the planet. They, they were, there were uh, still a lot of, um, of resources there and they just adapted what they had. For example, the woolly, the woolly mammoth, they grow more hair or, or thicker hair to uh, cope with the um, colder weathers. So basically it was a, a mix of, of everything. They were, there were less predators or big predators. There, were, there was uh, more food and uh, well, they had like the whole world for themselves. No, there were no, no humans. So there were no like the, the predator that we are now. So uh, basically that would be it. The, the adaptations that they have, they had everything on favor to grow as much as they could. Great, thank you, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we have also have multiple questions about the Mexican horse and any relation to today's horses in Mexico, for instance, those that carry people on the Kingdom of the Monarchs adventure. adventure. Mm -hmm. No, uh, well, okay, yes, <laughs> but like millions of years ago. Okay, so once again, let me, the ancient horses, like the very first horses in the world, in the planet Earth, evolved in North America and actually in the States. The, the oldest fossils are found somewhere on the north of Florida and that area over there. So they were the size of a deer or of a small deer. Este, from there, they evolved in the North America areas, like these sturdy horses that we have uh, in, in, in this image. Um, from there, they spread out to South America and to um, Eurasia, and then they moved from Eurasia, Eurasia to uh, Africa. In Europe, specifically in Europe, is where we find the first evidence of horse domestication, but that happened like 50 or 80,000 years ago. And by that time, the horses in America were going extinct already, 10,000 years ago, if we just close the numbers. So by the time that we have the ancient civilizations here in, or, or the, the Indian civilizations, the native civilizations in the Americas, we, we, want, we, we didn't have any horses. But the horses on Europe, let's just focus on Europe, they were domesticated already. Or in um, Mongolia, for example, those were like, some of the first as well. So when we had this discovery of the Americas by the, by the Spaniards and the English, French, and the rest of the Europeans, they brought the, the horses to uh, specifically, uh, going to the, to the question specifically, to Mexico. They brought the, the horses to Mexico. And from there, 
uh, well, the Mexican people just kept them. Actually, for example, the Mustang horses that you have on the States, those are feral horses. Those are not, we can say they are wild because they live in the wild, but they were domesticated horses that went wild. So we call those animals feral. So the horses that we have nowadays in America living in the wild are descendants of the domesticated horses that the Europeans brought that they domesticated from the prehistoric horses that moved from the Americas to Europe. I don't know if that makes sense. And the, the horses that we use, for example, in the monarch butterfly trips, those we say they are Mexican horses because those are like um, variations of the domesticated Spanish horse just to call it on a, on a way. So those are actually, they can be mules, they can be mix of, of horses and donkeys. They can be um, a, a variety of sub variety of a, of a horse that was a little bit more sturdy, shorter, more resistant to the, the area that is required there. But in general terms, they all um, come from domesticated horses that were brought by the Europeans. Excellent. Thanks for that additional explanation. So we also have a few questions about how scientists hypothesize that the ancient horses had these kind of zebra type stripes, the dark stripes similar to what's shown on the skin of the horses in this slide. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, all of these um, all of these illustrations are a lot of imagination. There are very few remains or, or fossils of the skin or of the fur or, or the patterns of the fur on, on all of these mammals. So actually, for example, uh, with the with the saber tooth cat, some of them say it was all like pale color, leonid color, uh, this um, beige. Uh, some others say there were more like striped color. The, the, I'm talking about the American cave lion. Striped, uh, sorry, the um, saber tooth cat in the Americas. Um, so it can be just like pale uh, sand color, um, like tiger lines, or like the jaguars, like like uh, circles. So those are hypotheses uh, in terms of what we see. Um, what we can compare with in the modern species. So the scientists, what they do is they compare like the genetic, um, well, yeah, like the genetic foot, uh, footprint or, or the marks on the ancient horses and they compare it with the genetic expression, the phenotype, the genetic expression on the modern wild horses or, or wild equus species like the zebra, like other uh, donkeys or horses that are found in, as I mentioned, Mongolia area. So those, these modern uh, equus, these modern horses present a certain um, markers in the chromosomes that are similar or, or, or they are like, they match with some other markers in the gen the genomics of the of the American horses or of the Mexican horse. So with that in mind, they say like, well, if this marker on the zebra, for example, is for the stripes, and I find this marker on the on the Mexican horse, very likely that the Mexican horse can have stripes. But then they find other markers on 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 gray is the uh, fur on, on one tone fur or they find markers on dots dot uh, fur so basically all of this is more than anything like artist representations based on what the scientists have found during all of these years in a genetic scale more than anything like comparative genetics basically okay Makes sense. Thanks. Okay. So was the glyptotherium at all related to a porcupine? The glyptotherium? No, actually, this is more related to the armadillos. 
the the modern armadillos are like causes in first or second degree <laughs> of the glyptotherium. Um, so basically, a, a glyptotherium is a giant armadillo without the bands. It's just like a whole conch or a whole uh, shell, but it's it's more related to the armadillo than the porcupine. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, but there's a question about the the large elephant and some water rings or markings on the tusks, and what if you had any guesses what that might be from? For the age of the elephants, right? It's, it's uh, similar. I believe that might be I... yeah the question yeah. Uh huh. Yes, they they can try. They have tried to do the the same, like the rings so on the tusks. They might mark uh, some some um, the age, some years of the elephant. But what I've heard of that is that it varies as well as with um, with the trees. That it depends. There can be other factors, a drought or a fire in the, in the tree rings. The same here if they were sick, if they were. But yeah, basically they can use the the rings on the on the tusks for what i've seen cool see all right uh last call for questions i believe so far melissa has very capably answered all these questions about testing her ancient knowledge <laughs> okay since that's it for the questions today I'd like to hand it back to Melissa for closing comments. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I think uh, what, what we can take from this is that we are just uh, a very tiny period in the in the book of history of the earth. <laughs> so we need to, to just look back and see what, ha what has happened to see what can happen and just uh, uh, be ready for that but be also grateful for what we have now and what we know now and just uh, I, I think we should uh, just learn more about our, our past just to to really appreciate our present and imagine our future absolutely that's a great takeaway thank you so much for taking the time to present for us melissa and i'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today if you're interested in information on how you can travel with NATHAB, please give us a call at 800-543-8917 or send us an email at info at nadhab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature, Wild Partnerships, Parasites, Pollinators, and More, presented by NADHAB Expedition Leader Arpita Dutta. You you can view the full lineup of upcoming webinars, including registration links, on our website at nadhab.com forward slash webinars. We also recorded today's presentation, so we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Thank you, Melissa. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.